Good evening, and <clears throat> weird. Good evening, and welcome to the Dusty Feet. <laughs> um, this will be a fun night tonight. Something very different, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. But let's get the usual out of the way, right? Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Those on Facebook, if you pop over to the YouTube and hit subscribe, you'll get it little that helps things. And then if you hit reminder, you'll get the reminders it's going to get, whether you watch it on Facebook or or YouTube. It, it doesn't matter really either way, but it helps with that. Um, and it, there's a live link on the Dusty Feet. If you go to dustyfeet.com, there's a, uh, a live link there, and you'll see. Uh, and so you can watch it on the dustyfeet.com because it's there. And then we also have all the old episodes there. Um, okay. Good evening. Tonight, we're going to do something different. Um, my dad uh, says, you know, aren't you, aren't you going to let him talk? And I said, well, okay. So, tonight, I'm going to defer a lot of my time tonight to Rabbi David Foreman. We haven't covered Aleph Beta in a while, and I didn't want to think that we'd lost any love or care or, or, or deal for, for Foreman. It's uh, very much that I enjoy and have been listening to this stuff, but this seemed the deal. We are in Passover. Passover's right around the corner. Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread, these feasts are right here. And this is a big picture story. We get very um, myopic sometimes in, in our thinking. We get very down in the weeds and, and down really in. And I tend to like to enjoy uh, a, a context picture. I kind of could draw out. I'm not a a micro guy, I'm a macro guy, okay? And then I, I have people that help me with the micro stuff. Uh, Skip Moen with individual words and those pieces, and that kind of draws the, the micro that Im improves my macro view, right? That's fair. So Foreman, it does this, and in this story, I was looking up some things and doing some things, and Foreman in this particular series um, took my macro and went, like, pull out even further. And, uh, and I go, wow, I, I, I love these kind of cool things. So, uh, the majority of my night tonight will be deferring to Rabbi da David Foreman and we'll be enjoying, um, this with him. So let's get started and let's enjoy, uh, the, it's called the Passover Exodus, the Passover Exodus, the Exodus story that could have been. Hi everybody, it is Rabbi David Foreman here, and Pesach is on its way. The Seder looms. You want to say something at the Seder, but at least at the Sedarim that I've personally been at, you know there's a problem, because the temptation is to focus on a lot of the little stuff. And at the beginning of the Haggadah, there is a lot of little stuff. There's a lot of what we might call prologue, stories about Rabbi Akiva and Bnei Brak, Ben Azai with the streaks in his beard, looking as if he were 70 years old. And, you know, it's easy to pick apart the minutiae associated with those stories. But by the time you're done with that, it's 11 at night, everybody's hungry. And frankly, nobody at the table's really gotten a chance to talk about any of the big stuff. The story of the Exodus, or even the larger themes that emerge from that story. In this video series, I'm going to try to focus with you on some of that big stuff. I want to help us develop a perspective on the Exodus saga as a whole and try to glimpse some new meaning in it, meaning that will enrich not only our understanding of the Exodus story, but also our understanding of our own destiny, because we're a nation that came into being through that story. I want to begin by sharing something which has always gnawed at me whenever I found myself rereading the biblical text that talks about the climax of the Exodus. I'm talking about the confrontation of Egypt and Israel at the Sea of Reeds. As Pharaoh's armies are chasing after the departing Hebrews, God tells Moses, that I'm going to split the sea, the Israelites are going to walk through on dry land, the Egyptians are going to chase them. And then the language of the text is God tells Moses that when that happens, I'm going to be honored through Pharaoh, through his army, through his chariot, through his horsemen. 
you know, you'll forgive me if this sounds a bit forward, but doesn't that kind of sound like a mean thing to say? I mean, here God is, he's about to destroy many hundreds of people, and he's speaking of this honor that's going to come to him. He's getting honor through their deaths? I mean, it just seems unbecoming of the Almighty to speak that way. I mean, look, yeah, it's true, the enemies of the Israelites are the Egyptians, and yeah, it is better that they be destroyed than be allowed to recapture and re-enslave the Israelites. But look, you know, it's one thing to defend Israel by killing her enemies. It's, it's another thing to take glory and honor from all of that killing. Why would you put it that way if you're God? Okay, so for a long time I kept quiet about this. It just felt like an uncomfortable thing to bring this up. But the truth is it's not just my own personal sensitivities that seem to run afoul of this verse. Interestingly enough, the sages of the Talmud actually once suggested that the Almighty himself shares these very same sensitivities. Here's actually what they say. The Holy One, blessed be He, does not rejoice in the downfall of evildoers. I mean, that's the value that you and I were talking about, and listen to their proof text. It comes from this very story of the sea. When the Egyptians were dying in the Sea of Reeds, as the waves came crashing down, at that moment, the heavenly angels wanted to sing in rapture before the Holy One, blessed be He. But God said to them, My creatures, they're drowning in the sea. You're going to pick this time to rejoice in front of me? It turns out that the sages ascribe the exact same intuition to the Almighty himself that we were talking about. You don't rejoice in the downfall of your enemies, particularly if you're God. God's the creator, and even his enemies are creatures that he's created. There's something bitter in the taste of victory against them. What's really weird is that the same story that we felt seemed to offend our sensitivities, the story of the splitting of the sea, is where the sages get their proof text from that God would never rejoice in the downfall of the wicked. So what's going on here? How could they have looked at that same story, which has this verse that talks about God taking glory and honor from the destruction of Egypt? How could they have looked at that story and say, no, God would never rejoice in the downfall of the wicked? They were surely aware of the verse. How could they ignore it? So I want to suggest to you that it's actually we who are misinterpreting the verse, not the sages. In other words, when the Almighty spoke of taking honor from all the king's horses and all the king's men, he wasn't actually talking about taking glory from the deaths of the Egyptians whatsoever. If you look carefully at the verse, it never says God's taking honor from their deaths. I'm taking honor from Pharaoh and from his horsemen and from his archers. The verse doesn't actually mean he's taking honor from their deaths. What it means is actually something else entirely. The glory that would come, as the text phrases it, from the chariots and archers of Egypt is actually the tip of a very large iceberg. An iceberg that shows us a whole new face of the entire Exodus story. As it turns out, these chariots and archers of Egypt that supposedly are going to be honoring God, it's not the first time we encounter them in the Torah. They show up one other time in the five books of Moses, earlier, at the very end of the book of Genesis, in a story that involves, of all things, a funeral procession for the patriarch Jacob. But the really remarkable thing is that it's not just this particular element of the Exodus, the chariots and the archers, that happened to appear earlier in the Genesis burial story. It's actually a whole bunch of elements from the Exodus story that seem to get borrowed by that very same burial story of Jacob. I want to kind of go through these similarities between the stories and then see what it is that you and I make of them. Let me give you an example. Here's a verse from the story of the burial of Jacob. It's an ordinary verse that wouldn't really cause even a raised eyebrow. As a matter of fact, it appears to tell us something so trivial that one wonders why it even needed to be said at all. The verse says that everyone went on this procession for Jacob, but they left behind their children, and they left behind their sheep, and they left behind their cattle, that they all left in the land of Goshen and Egypt, and everyone else went. Why did the Torah tell me that? I mean, imagine that the Torah had not gone out of its way to tell you whether or not the people joining Jacob's funeral procession had brought their little kids along with them. 
Let's say we had not been told whether the sheep and cattle had come along. Would you have read the story of Jacob's burial and then, you know, closed your copy of the Chumash in astonishment, slapped your knee and exclaimed, but I wonder what happened with all those little kids? Did they take them all along? Did they leave them with babysitters? What, what were the daycare arrangements like? And, and all those animals? Was someone cattle sitting? You probably wouldn't have said that, right? Why then does the Bible bother to tell us about these details? What significance is this completely trivial information? But consider this. In that phrase about the little kids and the cattle, we actually hear a premonition of things to come. Because when else in the Bible are there Israelites getting ready to leave Egypt? And then suddenly the issue of whether they bring along their little kids, their sheep, and their cattle starts to take center stage. That happens during the story of the Exodus. As you may recall from your previous knowledge of the Exodus, child care and animal care logistics actually were part of the negotiations between Moses and Pharaoh. Moses had originally asked Pharaoh not for a blanket release of all the Israelites to leave for good and make a new home for themselves in the Promised Land. On the contrary, Moses' original request to Pharaoh was much more limited. Could you please let your slaves go for just three days into the desert to worship their god, the creator that they worship? Pharaoh, of course, at first arrogantly denies that request, and later on he gives into it partially. He asks for the children and perhaps the cattle to be left behind. Look at that, the children and the animals, they become an issue. Interesting. But it could be a coincidence, but let's keep on going and see. Are there other parallels between the Exodus story and the burial of Jacob? Turns out there are. Consider the location at which the burial procession stopped for a while to eulogize Jacob before they got to their ultimate destination in the caves of Machpelah. This was called Goren Ha'atad. The Torah actually makes a point of telling us exactly where Goren Ha'atad was located. They came to Goren Ha'atad, which is on the other side of the Jordan River. But let's just do a little reality check of the geography. What exactly was the burial procession doing on the east bank of the Jordan? The shortest route from Egypt to Hebron is actually basically to just head northwest in a straight line. If the burial party traveled to Canaan via Goren Ha'atad, it means they went seriously out of their way. Leaving Egypt, they'd had to swoop down to the south of Canaan, traverse the entire Sinai Desert, swing up and around the Dead Sea, travel due north for the entire length of the sea, hook left to cross the Jordan River, probably somewhere near Jericho, and that would really be taking the long way. The truth is, I can't explain to you why they chose such a roundabout route for the burial procession, but the fact that they did is very intriguing. Because that particular route reminds the reader of another great journey. That was the route the children of Israel took centuries later in the event we know as the Exodus from Egypt. So the route of the burial party anticipates the route of the Exodus. Very intriguing. That's another connection between the burial story and the Exodus. But there's still one more connection I want to share with you. Let's talk about Canaanite onlookers. So in the burial story, the Torah makes a point of telling us that the Canaanites gazed out at the burial procession, which of course included lots of Egyptians along with the family of Jacob, and they exclaimed in wonder, what heavy mourning this is for Egypt. Well, in the Exodus story, wouldn't you know it, the Canaanite onlookers are back again. This time they appear in the ecstatic song of thanksgiving that the Israelites sing after the victory of the Sea of Reeds. If you look at that song, there's a role that the Canaanite onlookers have. And it's actually the same role as these onlookers had in the burial story. Shamu Amimir Gazun, Namogul Koyoshve Kanan, the inhabitants of Canaan, they react with astonishment at what's happened to Egypt. Egypt was this huge army, but they were destroyed. And now they're shrinking away in fear. So one by one, each of these elements from the burial story, they all seem to get repeated in the Exodus story. The chariots and the archers, the babysitting and the animal care arrangements, the route taken by Egypt to Israel, even the Canaanite onlookers. It seems as if these connections between the burial story and the Exodus stories are more than the product of mere coincidence. 
The Torah seems to be asking you and me, the reader, to line up these two journeys away from Egypt and to actually see them in relationship to one another. So here's the theory I'd like to suggest to you. I want to suggest that the Jacob's burial story is a kind of precursor to the Exodus story. And more than that, that the Torah actually sets up this burial story almost as a kind of lens through which you and I can look out upon the Exodus. If we look through that lens, we'll actually find ourselves looking at something remarkable, a whole new way of seeing the Exodus as a whole. That new perspective on the Exodus will help us answer the question we raised above about taking honor from killing people, what exactly that meant. But it's also, again, going to help us see really the whole story of the Exodus differently. It'll help us see our destiny differently because we are the nation that came into being through this story of the Exodus. But in order to see how that's so, we need to go back and examine the Jacob's burial story that lens just a little bit more carefully. Let's do that in the next video. Come with me, I'll see you there. So let's dive into the Jacob's burial story. As we said, the patriarch Jacob was eventually buried in the land of Canaan, but that did not just happen out of the blue. It was a delicately negotiated matter between Jacob and his son, Joseph. Here's the scene. Jacob, who's approaching death, calls for his beloved son, Joseph, and tells him that he wishes to be buried where his fathers were buried, a place known to us as the Cave of Machpelah, located in Hebron. The Torah then gives us Joseph's response to his father's request. Joseph says, Anochi e'ese kidvarecha, I'll do as you've asked. Now, if the book of Genesis had ended right there, and you had to guess what the very next thing to happen was, what would you imagine taking place right now? I mean, if you were Jacob, lying there on your bed, and you would express this request to your loyal son, and he'd answered, yes, father, you can totally count on me to bury you in the family tomb, what would you do next? I don't know about you, but if I'd been in Jacob's shoes at that moment, I might have said something like, thank you very much, son. I knew I could count on you. I mean, something in that general ballpark, at least. But that is not at all what Jacob says. Instead, he tells his son this. He shavali, swear to me that you'll do it. I mean, is this for real? Here's your loyal son assuring you that he's going to do exactly what you asked of him, and you ask him to swear that he'll really do it? What a terribly awkward thing to ask of him. Is Jacob intimating that he doesn't trust him? So whatever Joseph might think of his father's demand, he does in fact take that oath. And then Jacob does another strange thing. Vayishtachu Yisrael al Rosh HaMitah, the verse says. And Jacob then bowed towards the head of the bed. Why would he do that? The ancient sages of the Midrash wondered about that, and here's what they said. He did it al shahaita mitato shleima she'in barasha. He bowed that way in recognition of the fact that he now saw his progeny was complete, that all of his legacy, all of his children were righteous and there were no wicked ones among them, that Joseph had been a melech, that shenishba leben agoyim, he was a, a king among the Gentiles, he was captured away from the family, but still he was just as righteous as before. According to the sages, when Joseph agreed with Jacob's request, Jacob saw how righteous his son was. Despite Joseph's many years in Egypt, he had not assimilated into the heathen culture. Jacob now felt his legacy was complete, and he bowed in gratitude. But let's take a minute to ponder what the sages are actually telling us here. They suggest that Jacob had what amounts to a revelatory moment at the end of this discussion with him about burial arrangements. Seventeen years into his life in Egypt, he finally realized that his son had not assimilated into heathen culture. But should it really have taken Jacob 17 years to realize that? Put yourself in Jacob's shoes. Looking back over the course of your life, if you could identify any one moment and only one moment at which you came to realize that, yes, your beloved son Joseph, he was still a loyal, God-fearing member of this budding family of Israel, when would that moment have been? It would have been 17 years before this, right? 
When you first set eyes on your long lost son, Joseph, after two decades of being apart, Joseph had run to greet him, had embraced him, had cried, had set the family up in Goshen, taken care of their every need. Look at him. He's a God-fearing man, Joseph is. He's devoted to his family. Power hasn't made him forget his roots. That seems like the moment Jacob should have realized what a good son Joseph is. Why then do the sages say that it's only now, 17 years later, on his deathbed, that Jacob understands this? The sages of the matter seem to be telling us that despite all of this, Jacob was uncertain whether Joseph would really fulfill his request and that this was really the moment of truth that would decide whether he was a righteous son. He needed Joseph to swear to him that he'd bury him. Why? But the truth is, if you keep on reading the story, if you fast forward to the moment that Jacob actually dies and you watch what happens, you see, I think, that Jacob was on to something here. It seems he did have reason to fear, maybe, that his wishes to be buried in Canaan wouldn't be so easy to fulfill. Look what happens when he dies. The text tells us that Joseph weeps over the body of his father, and then he gets up. One would assume that if Joseph hadn't yet spoken to Pharaoh about his father's peculiar burial request, right about now would be the time to do that. But he doesn't do it. Instead, Vayitzav Yosef et avadav et harofim lachanot et aviv. Yosef commands his servants, commands the healers, to embalm his father's body. And they do so. Instead of speaking to Pharaoh about his father's request, Joseph proceeds with what was apparently standard operating procedure for the death of a member of the royal family. He directs that Jacob's body be embalmed. The strange thing is, the embalming process actually takes weeks, and still, through it all, Joseph remains silent. Why isn't he saying anything to Pharaoh? Maybe he's afraid to. Maybe he's procrastinating. Maybe he's worried about how Pharaoh will respond to a request for burial in Canaan. Consider this. Egypt seems to see itself as very emotionally invested in the death of Jacob. The text tells us that Egypt cried over the death of Jacob for 70 days. Compare those to the future deaths of Aaron and Moses. The children of Israel, when they die, will only mourn each of those great leaders for 30 days. The Egyptians, they mourn Jacob for 70 and it wasn't even Jacob's own nation that did that for him. It was a foreign nation. His death mattered deeply to them. Why? Because who was Jacob in Egypt's eyes? Jacob's the father of Egypt's savior, Joseph. Joseph saved everyone from starvation. He's the second in command to their king. And if Joseph is Egyptian royalty, then Jacob, his father, was treated by the nation and by Pharaoh as royalty too, which means that when he dies, his funeral will be a state funeral. Pharaoh's going to see to that. But how do you think Pharaoh will feel about Egyptian royalty being buried in a little backwater of the Middle East called Canaan? Imagine Queen Elizabeth dies. She gets buried in Madagascar. Things like that don't happen. To even make such a request of Egypt's king would seem to be outrageous. Jacob did have reason to make Joseph swear he'd bury him in Canaan. Jacob knew how hard it would be for Joseph to make the request of Pharaoh to be buried there. And he knew, once Joseph swore he would do it, that his son was righteous. Because in the ultimate test of loyalty, his son had just chosen his interests over those of the most powerful man in the world. He had just chosen Jacob over Pharaoh. This choice that faced Joseph, in truth, was not just a choice between loyalty to father and loyalty to a generic, powerful benefactor. It was, in fact, a much more emotionally wrenching choice for Joseph. It was really a choice between two fathers. For who really was Pharaoh to Joseph? Joseph, remember, had been kidnapped and sold off as a slave to Egypt when he was a mere 17 years old. There, in that foreign land, he had languished in prison for many long years until suddenly a surprise benefactor pulled him out of the dungeon, asking if he perhaps knew how to interpret some dreams. That man was Pharaoh. After Joseph successfully interpreted those dreams, not only did Pharaoh make Joseph's life dramatically better than it had been before, he made it better in certain crucial ways. He gave him a wife. He gave him a new name. 
He gave him a job. What kind of person helps you find a wife, gives you a name, and can give you a job at the family business? A father does those things for you. And speaking of father, let's talk about how Pharaoh first gets to know Joseph. What was their topic of conversation? Could you interpret my dreams, please? What was the last topic of conversation Joseph discussed with his own father before getting thrown in that pit? It was his own dreams and their meaning. Jacob had angrily denounced the implication of Joseph's dreams about the sun and the moon and the stars bowing to him. It seemed like Joseph was thinking he would have some kind of ultimate power, but now a new kind of father would come on the scene. And, in another conversation about dreams, that new father, Pharaoh, would be so enthralled with Joseph that he would in fact gift him the very power that Joseph had once dreamed about himself. He would make Joseph second in charge to the most powerful person in the world. Second in charge. Hmm, we've heard that before, haven't we? Yes, Joseph occupied the same position in Pharaoh's household that he had occupied back at home. He was second in charge to the ultimate power. At home, that man on top had been his father. Now in Egypt, that man was Pharaoh. It seemed like Joseph really did have a father-son relationship going with Pharaoh, which is all fine and well. Except that Joseph, of course, has a real father too, and eventually that real father Jacob shows up in Egypt and re-enters Joseph's life. So, for Joseph, everything is fine as long as the interests of those two men, those two fathers, Jacob and Pharaoh, aligned with one another. But what would happen if they ever didn't? Now is that time. That discussion that Jacob had with Joseph is the moment when Pharaoh's and Jacob's interests diverge. There's just no way to make both men happy anymore. When Joseph is with Pharaoh, he can treat him like a father. When he's with Jacob, he can treat him like a father. But now, both these men want different things, and to honor one may seem to be disloyal to the other. What now? Now we understand why it took Jacob 17 years of living in Egypt to realize that Joseph was righteous, to realize that Joseph was a completely loyal son, because Jacob knew the risks Joseph would take by even bringing up the idea of burial in Canaan with Pharaoh. Trying to honor that request could come at a real price for Joseph. His loyalty to Pharaoh and to Egypt could be questioned. When Joseph swore that he would bury Jacob in Canaan, Jacob understood what that meant. Joseph accepted the risk. In a contest of loyalty between Jacob and Pharaoh, Joseph had just chosen Jacob. Still, it's one thing to make a promise, and it's another thing to carry it out. How in practice did Joseph manage to actually approach Pharaoh with news of the state funeral that would have to be held in Canaan? And how, in the end, did Pharaoh respond to that outrageous request? The answer to these questions revealed that it wasn't just Joseph who acted honorably and heroically in the affair of Jacob's funeral. Heroism also came from other unexpected quarters as well. So Jacob dies. His body is embalmed and the people mourn him. Finally, the time comes when Joseph can delay no more. So let's listen in. How exactly does he approach Pharaoh to talk about his father's burial request? The days of mourning were over and then Joseph came and spoke to the house of Pharaoh saying, if I have found favor in your eyes, could you please approach Pharaoh on my behalf and say the following? 
So notice that Joseph seems to be avoiding a direct discussion with Pharaoh. He talks to people in the court of Pharaoh and wants them to carry a message to the king for him. Also, look at the language Joseph uses to address these lower-level courtiers. If I found favor in your eyes, please. He's beseeching them to go to Pharaoh on his behalf. Who is he talking to so plaintively? I mean, Joseph outranks every last member of Pharaoh's court. It's as if the vice president were beseeching the deputy housing secretary to deliver a personal message on his behalf to the president. The whole spectacle must have seemed just absolutely absurd. Seemingly, Joseph is avoiding a one-on-one audience with Pharaoh, and we can certainly understand why. Think about what Egypt had done for Jacob. They not only mourned him, they'd embalmed his body for 30 days. Why? Well, what's the whole point of embalming? In the religion of ancient Egypt, one enters the afterlife with his physical body. You would embalm a body to preserve it from decaying, eventually into dust, so that it will be available as a vehicle to take you to some other world beyond our own. And now, consider what it was that Jacob wanted done to his body. He wanted it buried in the earth. And think about that. Burial and embalming, they aren't just two different ways of relating to a corpse. They're exactly the opposite ways of relating to a corpse. Burial, the Israelite custom, facilitates the body's return to dust. As the Torah says, you're dust and to dust you're going to return. Egyptians then would be horrified at the notion of burying one of their royalty. Why would you do such a thing? You're destroying his vehicle to the afterlife. So Joseph, if you think about it, has really gotten himself back into a corner here. I mean, if after 40 days of embalming and 70 days of mourning, Joseph finally gets around to asking permission to bury Jacob in the ground, well, at the very least, he could expect Pharaoh to ask rather acidly why Joseph didn't bring up this fine idea 70 days ago. What are we supposed to do now? Pretend that all the embalming and mourning just didn't happen? The honor and fanfare that we gave to your father means nothing to you? At best, Pharaoh might be incredulous. At worst, rageful. Perhaps Joseph doesn't want to be there in person to see Pharaoh's response. Maybe this is an idea better brokered to him by somebody else. So here's the message that Joseph asks these courtiers to deliver. Avi hishbiani lemar, my father made me swear. He made bekivri. I'm going to die. I want you to bury me in the grave that I created for myself in the land of Canaan. Let me go bury my father, the Ashuva, and I will return. The very first thing Joseph mentions to Pharaoh through these courtiers is Jacob's oath. And his meaning is clear. If it weren't for this oath, we wouldn't be talking about this. I just can't break a solemn oath to my father. I'm sure you can understand that. The oath, Joseph hopes, will take some of the sting out of it for Pharaoh. It's ironic, perhaps, and one wonders whether Joseph maybe anticipated this at the time, but the oath that Jacob made Joseph take in the end wasn't just something that bound Joseph to his promise, but it actually became a tool that Joseph could actually use to make good on his promise. The oath doesn't help the fact that Jacob's body has already been embalmed, but the oath does give Joseph just a little bit of distance from a request that, were it to have originated simply in Joseph's heart, could have been explosive. Finally, Joseph says one last thing to Pharaoh, and I shall return, the Ashuva. It seems strange that he'd even need to say it, as if he needs to assure the king that his loyal servant will faithfully return. But Joseph is doing what he can to reassure Pharaoh. It's like he's saying, I don't intend to be disloyal to you. I will come back to you. Please just let me do this. And so with those final words, Joseph has finally said to the king what he has to say. The die is cast. It's now up to Pharaoh how to respond. And how does Pharaoh respond? Pharaoh actually says yes. Now, at first, it seems like a very reluctant yes, uttered through gritted teeth. Vayomer paro, aleyu kvorat avicha, kasher hishbiacha. Pharaoh said, go and bury your father as he made you swear. Those last words, as he made you swear, 
really seemed to color the tone of the statement. As Rashi puts it, Pharaoh seems to be saying, I'm not going to make you violate an oath that you made to your father, but were it not for that oath, never would I allow such an outrage. But if you were Joseph in that situation, look, you'd take what you can get. A half-hearted yes is better than no yes at all, you'd probably tell yourself. Joseph has the permission he needs, even if it was given begrudgingly. And as for Pharaoh, with his cold yes, he can just wash his hands of the whole awkward affair and move on to other pressing affairs of state. The drama basically seems to be over. But then, in the very next verse, something remarkable happens. Vayal Yosef likvoret aviv, Joseph goes up to bury his father. Vayalu ito kol avde paro, but up with him go all the servants of Pharaoh, ziknei beto, the elders of his house, the whole ziknei eretz mitzrayim, all the elders of Egypt. When the time comes for Jacob's burial procession to actually get underway, it turns out that it's not just the family of Jacob who goes quietly and unobtrusively to do what they have to do in the land of Canaan. An entourage from Egypt accompanies them, a delegation of such stature that it could only have been sent by the king himself. All of Pharaoh's servants set out with the family along with the elders of the king's court. And it's not just they who go. The palace officials are joined by elders of Egypt, leaders of the general Egyptian populace. All of these people, they're all going to accompany Joseph's father on his final journey. And one last very special group will be coming along too. Vayal imo gam rechev gam parashim. Vayiamachana kaved ma'od. Chariots and archers went up as well. The camp was very great. Chariots and archers. What would chariots and archers be doing there? This was a funeral, not a campaign of war. But a moment's reflection is enough to settle that question. They were an honor guard. Pharaoh had sent them, too, to escort Joseph's father on his final journey. All in all, when the time actually came for Jacob's burial procession to depart, Pharaoh did not adopt the stance of a cold yes at all. He sent the finest of Egypt to accompany these Hebrews on their mission to Canaan. All the pageantry of Egypt accompanied a procession of Jacob's family on their way to a little Mesopotamian backwater called Canaan. What a peculiar sight that procession must have been. The text tells the reader as much when it says that, when the procession stopped to eulogize Jacob, the local Canaanites looked on in disbelieving wonder. Vayar Yoshev Hayaretz Aknani at Evel, the Goren Hatad, the Canaanites. They saw the mourning in a place called Goren Hatad, Vayomru, and they said, Evel Kaved Zelam Mitzrayim. What a remarkable, heavy mourning this is for Egypt. Note that the Canaanites viewed this as mourning for Egypt, even though it was really mourning for Jacob. On the one hand, Pharaoh and Egypt had adopted Jacob as a kind of national father for Egypt itself. That's why they mourned him so deeply. It really was a mourning for Egypt, like the Canaanites said. And yet, Pharaoh also recognized that Jacob couldn't be entirely recast in Egypt's image. Jacob's true wishes needed to be honored, even if they conflicted with the greater glory of Egypt. A state funeral beyond Egypt's borders? A great figure of Egyptian royalty buried according to Hebrew, not Egyptian custom. What will all the other nations say? For Pharaoh, it didn't matter. Public relations concerns, what the Canaanites would say, that was not going to be a factor. The loyalty of Egypt to its adopted father is not going to stop at Egypt's door. Will there be some cultural awkwardness in all of this for the royal courtiers and the captains of the king's guard? Yeah, there probably will be. And burial after embalming? Look, it certainly wasn't the easiest thing to get used to. This is, after all, how Father said he wants to be honored. It's not about us, it's about him. The story of Jacob's burial in the end is the story of two heroes. The first is Joseph. Joseph risked everything to bury his father according to his wishes. He risked the loss of power, prestige, and perhaps most of all his good standing in the eyes of his adopted father, Pharaoh. 
But the second hero, unlikely as it may seem, is Pharaoh himself. He resisted the urge to impose upon the venerated Jacob an exclusively Egyptian identity. He allowed Jacob to be who he was, Israelite, not Egyptian, and still he and the populace would cherish him. Still he and Egypt would regard Jacob as royalty. They would accord him all the honor of a king, a national father, notwithstanding Jacob's rather public decision that Canaan was his true home. The humility evinced by Pharaoh's stance is nothing short of remarkable. Having looked carefully at the story of Jacob's burial, we're now in a position to come back to the questions we asked earlier about the way in which the Exodus seems to parallel that story. As we saw before, the text includes many connections between these two events. What are we to make of those? What would a burial story for a patriarch have to do with an exodus of hundreds of thousands of people from a land that oppressed them? I'll give you my thoughts on that in the next video. Okay, so now it's time for us to return to the question we raised earlier about the apparent links between the story of Jacob's burial and the Exodus. We saw that in one detail after another, these two events seem to echo each other. In both cases, it's not just the Israelites who go on a journey away from Egypt. Pharaoh sends his chariots and archers as well. The babysitting arrangements and the animal care logistics, these show up in Jacob's funeral, and they again become an issue in the Exodus. The circuitous route taken by the burial party ends up being the same route taken by the Israelites in the Exodus. And, in both stories, the Canaanites observe what's happening with Egypt and are astonished. These connections, as we saw before, they don't seem to be coincidental, but what are we to make of them all? Seemingly, they only make sense if, in some essential way, the burial story and the Exodus stories are about the same thing. But how would that be the case? How do these stories converge? Well, how about this? The burial story was about a procession setting out from Egypt that was designed to honor a father. What if we started thinking about the Exodus story in precisely that same way? It too was a procession setting out from Egypt, a procession designed to honor a father. It's just that the identity of the father changes. It's no longer an earthly father that's being honored, but a heavenly one. In other words, maybe we need to make a slight adjustment in how you and I view the Exodus process as a whole. If someone stopped you in the street and asked you, so, what was the Exodus about, like in a sentence or less? How did the Exodus change the status quo? So the most obvious answer that would come to mind is the Exodus freed the Israelites from slavery. It set them on a path of becoming a new nation. And that's true. It's just not the whole truth. There was another agenda in the Exodus as well. Now we talk about this at length in another Aleph Beta course. The link is below. But that agenda jumps out at you from a number of different elements in the story. Take, for example, the Ten Plagues themselves. If you think about it, that was really the long way of doing things, wasn't it? I mean, God could have just avoided all the plagues and simply whisked the Israelites out of Egypt on magic carpets. Why bother with the plagues? Or maybe if you're going to use harsh measures like plagues, just use a single overwhelming one, like the smiting of the firstborn. Just do that at the very beginning and get things over with. Why did God choose to do it the long way? Ten plagues. Clearly, there was another agenda besides just freeing the nation. God was interested in showing something through those plagues. As God himself tells Moses, more than once, the plagues are there so that so that Egypt will know that I am God. The Egyptians, they weren't atheists. They believed in gods. They just believed in lots of them. One of the goals of the Exodus, seemingly, was to demonstrate that polytheistic faith was mistaken. There's a single God in control of all of nature, 
that God is the creator, the author of every aspect of nature, humans included. The basic idea of monotheism is that human beings don't just have earthly parents, we have a heavenly parent too. Ten plagues would demonstrate that. It would demonstrate control over every single aspect of nature. Only the author of nature could marshal that total control. If Egypt looked at what was happening in the Exodus objectively, they could have come to understand who this god of the Hebrews was. They could have understand that this being is the parent of all. That realization, had Egypt made it, would have had repercussions. In the long term, it would have stood the test of time as a historic testament to the truth of monotheism. Egypt was the ancient world's greatest power if the king of that nation, who regarded himself as a god, would come to profess belief in a god to whom he was subject, a creator of all. That would be impressive indeed. Any future people could look upon those events of the Exodus, and if they ever doubted there was a creator, could see in those events evidence of this. But it wasn't just in the long term that there would be repercussions to Egypt's recognition of a creator. There would be repercussions in the short term also. Because if Egypt understood that there was a creator of all, and that this creator viewed the subjugation of one of his children to be a moral travesty, then Pharaoh would be bound morally to realize that he really has to let the Israelites go. If God the Creator condemned the brutal enslavement of Israel, Pharaoh, a subject of the Creator, couldn't really ignore that. As a matter of fact, this would actually be the fastest and quickest way to engineer the whole Exodus. If Egypt could only be brought to that recognition, it could all be over very quickly. If you look at the Exodus carefully, you'll find that very early on, there was hope of bringing Pharaoh to the brink of this recognition. Before all the plagues, in the very first audience that Moses ever has with Pharaoh, he tells him very straightforwardly who this God of the Hebrews really is. He tells him that he's not just a God among gods, but that he's the creator, the father of all. And then he tells him, what this God wants Pharaoh to do. Ko amar Hashem alokei Yisrael, shalach et amivia chogeli bamidbar. Send forth my people and let them celebrate with me in the desert. The request was just to celebrate in the desert. And Moses, in conversation with Pharaoh just a verse or two later, clarifies that he's really only asking for the Hebrews to leave for three days. Nelcha na derash loshen yamibamidbar, he says. Let us just go for three days in the desert. And let me ask you, I mean, why did God only ask for that? God would have had the power to compel Pharaoh to agree to the real plan, the freeing of the slaves. Why bother lying and saying you plan on coming back when really you plan on leaving forever? Unless maybe it wasn't a lie. Now, this is something we talk about in another series of videos, and I referenced them before. You can find them linked below. But maybe... Had Pharaoh agreed to the three-day work holiday request, the Hebrews really would have come back. It would have been a first step. You, Pharaoh, you've just agreed to allow some religious freedom for your slaves. Excellent. And slowly, Pharaoh could be brought around to a key realization that it wasn't just a local provincial god that these Hebrews were celebrating with. It was the creator himself. And if the God of the Hebrews really was the creator of all, well, then Pharaoh and Egypt would be obliged to serve him as well. Okay, but how, you might ask, could Pharaoh have possibly been brought around to recognize the existence of a creator in the absence of plagues that would demonstrate that manifestly? How could he have been brought to see that truth in a peaceful kind of way? I'm speculating here, but I think it's interesting that in the text of the Torah we do find that God, way back at the beginning of the Exodus, before any plagues, God gave Moses a single sign by which he could prove his authenticity to Pharaoh. And the strange thing is, the sign doesn't even really seem all that impressive. 
God tells Moses to take his staff, and if Pharaoh should ever say, Tznu lachem mofet, give me some sort of sign to substantiate what you're saying, that you should then say to Aaron to take his staff, vashleich lifnei paro, to cast it down before Pharaoh, veyihi letanin, and it will become a serpent. So you might say, what's so incredibly special about that sign? I mean, especially the fact that when Moses and Aaron actually do it, all of Pharaoh's sorcerers go and cast down their own staffs, and those become serpents as well. So that, you know, really takes the wind out of the sails of the sign, wouldn't you say? Except that maybe we haven't actually seen the sign yet. You gotta keep looking. Right after those astrologers cast down their staffs and become serpents, the staff of Aaron swallows up all of their staffs. Maybe that was the sign. Aaron's staff goes and swallows all the other serpents in the room. That was it. Think of the message to Pharaoh here. Yes, there are many powers out there, but there's one power to rule them all. Imagine that Pharaoh had fearlessly drawn the evident logical conclusion from that sign, the only sign that God had ever given Moses to establish his veracity in Pharaoh's presence. One serpent swallows all the other serpents. One power rules all the other powers. Had Pharaoh come to understand that, it would all be over before it even began. He would have seen that the world contains a God who is the creator of all, and he would have understood that he, no less than Moses and Aaron and the Hebrews, was a subject of that God and must obey his will. In the exodus that actually transpired, of course, Pharaoh rejected Moses' words out of hand, and he didn't pay any heed to that sign. And so, the process of education would need to continue. But now it would continue the hard way. The plagues would come. And so now, let's return to the connection between the Jacob's burial story and the Exodus story. As we said before, the burial procession was about a son making a journey to honor his father. And the Exodus story is really about the same thing. The Exodus had started with one request, a request for a journey, a procession in which a son would honor a father, the way father said he wanted to be honored. The son this time was Israel, and the father was God, the creator. Remember how God instructed Moses to tell Pharaoh to let his firstborn child go, so that his child can serve him. This was a father coming for his child. The theory I'm suggesting to you is that the Jacob's burial story really serves as a kind of blueprint for the way the Exodus was supposed to turn out. By comparing the blueprint version of the story back in the book of Genesis with the actual realization of the Passover story in Exodus, we can learn something about what, in the largest of pictures, the Exodus story had been designed to achieve and what the nation birthed through that story, Israel, is meant to achieve even today. Let's go to our last video and I'll explore that with you now. In a very real way, the reaction of Joseph's pharaoh created an opportunity, a precedent of sorts, for how an Egyptian king might wrestle with a very particular challenge. What do you do when a child you thought was yours expresses an allegiance to another, deeper father? And let me explain to you what I mean by putting things this way. As we saw, the pharaoh in Joseph's day thought that he had a right to Joseph's loyalty, After all, Joseph had been like a son to him. When Joseph asked permission to leave Egypt because of something he needed to do for his father Jacob, Joseph's pharaoh had acted heroically in a way. He recognized that Joseph's primary allegiance rightfully belonged to Jacob over him. 
that when all is said and done, Jacob was the deeper father here with a more primary claim on Joseph's service. But Pharaoh actually did something even more heroic than that. He didn't just allow Joseph to leave quietly and unobtrusively. He sent an honor guard of chariots and horsemen to accompany him. He wanted to be part of that procession. Why? Because he recognized at the end of the day that Jacob was not just the father of Joseph, but he was a kind of national father for Egypt as well, and that Jacob's wishes to be buried in Canaan couldn't be allowed to diminish his status in Egypt's eyes. If father wants to be buried in Canaan, we will not take that as a snub and turn our backs on him. We will honor those wishes. We will be part of the parade too. Now in a deep way, the Pharaoh in the days of Moses was confronted with an almost precisely analogous series of choices. As we've seen, the original benevolent Pharaoh in the times of Joseph had treated Joseph like an adoptive son. Ever since then, the vestiges of that relationship had lingered. To some extent, the Egyptian throne continued to look upon the Israelites as its child. But that relationship had decayed. It was as if the loving surrogate father had become an evil and abusive caricature of his former self. He demanded the loyalty of his child, but extended none of the love a father would give to one of his own. The Egyptian throne abused its child and enslaved it, and brutally inured itself to the child's cries for mercy. Then... One day, Moses came to Pharaoh with news for him. The child Pharaoh thinks is his has another father as well. A deeper father than Pharaoh, a heavenly father. This father in heaven wants his child to go into the desert for a few days to serve him. It's the first step in redeeming that child. When Moses came with this request, Moses' pharaoh should have rightfully have looked to Joseph's pharaoh for a lesson as to how to deal with that situation. With precedent in hand, he should have acted heroically. He ought to have recognized that Israel's primary allegiance rightfully belonged to a deeper father than him, to Heavenly Father. As a matter of fact, the pharaoh of Moses' day should have gone even further he, like Joseph's Pharaoh, should have recognized that Father in Heaven wasn't just a father of Israel. He was a universal father, a father even of Egypt. Thus, Pharaoh shouldn't have just allowed the Israelites to go into the desert for a few days to honor their Heavenly Father quietly and unobtrusively. He should have sent an honor guard of chariots and horsemen to accompany the departing Israelites. After all, it was Egypt's father too. At the end of the day, Moses' pharaoh should have made the same calculation that Joseph's pharaoh did. Father's wishes to take the Israelites to Canaan. They can't be allowed to diminish the reverence we Egyptians give to Father in heaven. If Father wants to do this, we're not going to take that as a snub and turn our backs on him. We're going to honor his wishes. We'll be part of the parade too. Moses' pharaoh could have done that, but he didn't. In the end, the Pharaoh of Moses' day was not able to muster the honesty, the humility, the courage necessary to recognize that there was a deeper master than he. So, when Israel finally did leave Egypt, they would leave all alone. There would be no Egyptian multitudes escorting them out joyously with pomp and circumstance. There would be no Egyptian horsemen and chariots. There would be no Canaanite throngs exclaiming about the wonder of it all except that there would be. The master of the universe would see to it that there would be. In his blindness, Pharaoh thought the chariots and archers were there to pursue his escaping slaves. But that wasn't really their purpose. God would appropriate those chariots and archers for his own purposes. So, centuries after they first made their appearance, the chariots and horsemen of Egypt would indeed show up again. They would come to provide honor for God. But now we understand it's not their deaths that would provoke honor, as we'd presumed before, but their accompaniment of Israel that would do this. 
It was as if God looked out at the scene at Israel departing Egypt all alone and said something's missing in this picture. The first time around, there was a great military escort to honor Bonner. What happened to my honor guard? And so God would see to it that the honor guard came. I'm going to strengthen Egypt's heart so they'll come after you. I'm going to be honored through Pharaoh and all of his army, with his chariots, with his archers. And not only that, the Canaanite throngs would be back too. Centuries before, they'd exclaimed in amazement at the honor Egypt had given to a universal father. Now, they would exclaim in trepidation about the honor that father had taken brazenly from a recalcitrant Egypt. Shamu Amim Yirgazun, the nations heard what happened to Egypt. Namogu Kol Kanan, the inhabitants of Canaan, they shrank away in fear. Those words, they come from the song that Israel sings at the sea after their Egyptian pursuers are vanquished. So, one way or the other, those Canaanites, they'd be back. They'd look upon Egypt and they'd be amazed. Only this time, they wouldn't see Egypt's joyous celebration of father as they had in Joseph's days. Instead, tragically, they would see Egypt's destruction. The ideal plan was for Egypt to participate in the Exodus as a real player on the grand stage of history. The plan was that they and the Israelites, like long ago, they would form a single joyous camp, enthusiastically partnering in paying homage to Father. Go back to the burial scene. Vayalimo gam rechev gam parashim. Along with Joseph went those chariots and archers. Vayihiamachane kaved maod. And the camp was very great. Look at that verse in Jacob's burial processions. To all eyes, there was actually just one single camp. The Israelites and Egyptians, they were all united in a single purpose. And that was the way it was supposed to be again in the days of Israel's exodus. The tragedy of the Exodus, as it actually came to pass, was that there was no longer one camp, but two. Look at this verse. Vayavo bein machana Mitzrayim bein machana Yisrael. The glorious divine cloud, it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. The Egyptians had chosen to pursue the Israelites when they left Egypt with malice instead of with joy. And so... At the Sea of Reeds, there needed to be two camps. The divine cloud needed to separate between them, instead of there being one camp with the divine cloud among them. And therein lies the tragedy brought about through Pharaoh's recalcitrance. Which brings us to consider the future. The parallels between the Jacob's burial story and the Exodus story seem to suggest, as we've seen, that there was a more ideal way for the Exodus to have played out. There was an Exodus that might have been, as it were, an Exodus in which Jew and Gentile would have left Egypt in a shared procession all in one joyous camp, an Exodus in which freed slaves would be accompanied by an honor guard of former oppressors all joining together in a procession to honor Father. But if the exodus that might have been did not actually occur, why does it matter to us? Generally, historians don't spend all that much time debating what could have happened but didn't. Why should we? The answer is because we're not historians. Judaism has always insisted that the Torah wasn't written to merely be a history book. Instead, the Torah is meant to be a guidebook. Sometimes the Torah guides us by telling us laws, and sometimes it guides us by telling us stories about our past. The stories are relevant not just because they once happened. They're relevant because, like law, they can help shape us into our best possible selves. The exodus that might have been is hinted to in the Torah because it guides us. It teaches us that the exodus was not just about freeing slaves or just about a nation that happened to gain independence through divine intervention. It was actually about something else, too. It was about a procession designed to honor the Father in heaven, a joint procession. Just like the burial procession of Jacob, the exodus in its perfect form was supposed to be a procession including multitudes. 
In the end, the exodus from Egypt brought us only part of the way to that vision, because the procession that departed Egypt was in fact just a shadow of what it might have been. We were the only ones who embarked on that journey. What of all the others? It will be the destiny of Jew and Gentile to one day realize the promise of that journey as it should have taken place, to march side by side and to proclaim in unison the oneness of a father that we all share. The prophets of Israel would speak often of that destiny. If we read the words of those prophets, we can't help but hear in their words the longing to complete the Exodus's unfinished journey. Neum Hashem Elokim mekabetz nidchei Yisrael od akabetz alav lenikbatzav. Thus says God, the one who gathers in all the dispersed people of Israel, I will gather still others to God besides those of Israel that are gathered. Isaiah is talking about a time when God's going to gather in to the land of Canaan all the dispersed people of Israel, but when he does so, he's going to gather others besides Israel. They'll all come in a grand procession. Ubnei hanechar hanilvim al Hashem and also the Gentiles, those that join themselves to accompany God, to serve him, ulava et shem Hashem, and to love the name of Hashem. I'm going to bring them to my holy mountain. I'm going to make them joyful in my house of prayer. The last time there was a procession like this, the Israelites had traveled all alone. Egyptians had pursued them, but had not really joined them. And therefore, separation had to be the order of the day. Israel needed to be separated by the divine cloud from those that pursued them. But, in the procession of the future, separation shall be a thing of the past. V'al yomar ben ha'nechar, Isaiah says, Hanilva el Hashem lemor, havdel yavdilani Hashem el amo. Let not the child of a Gentile, who wishes to accompany those who are with God, let him not say, God has surely separated me from among his people. So once again, there's going to be a great procession, one overwhelmingly large camp devoted to the honor of Father. It's going to be a journey that would redeem the missed opportunities of Israel's very first journey, the Exodus. The journey taken at the end of days is going to mirror the journey that should have been taken at the original Passover, at the beginning of days for Israel, at Israel's birth. This time in the future, all nations would join together to honor the Father of all. May we speedily see the day. Yeah, may we speedily see the day. There's just so much to unpack in there. And I thought it was a worthwhile message to share. Um, again, macro view of things, I don't think you would have arbitrarily thought that Passover elements that play out in it that you would think to go back to Joseph's trip and the bearing of Jacob. And yet the story as it, as it unfolds, draws so many more elements to it. And, uh, and I think that it's a good thing. And number two, that um, we will be one camp again. I'd like to see us just daily try to be one camp again. I saw a little clip from Francis Chan on Unity that we are so fractured and so splintered. And we don't even know what Unity means. I, I think that word is almost incomprehensible. Almost in incomprehensible. But we'll try. But we'll try. So uh, the videos that we saw are in the link below. Um, if you don't have a... Um, if you go on the Aleph Beta site and you need more time to watch some of those things, and that happens because they have a time limit, because that's the way it works. If you want more time... And those interest you, um, 
I think it's a contact form on thedustofeed.com, but send me an email at bob at thedustofeed.com, okay? And I have an educator's account there, and you can, I'll log you in, and you can go on the site, and you get longer setups with these, especially access to, to, to these, um, so you can see them and go over them if you want to listen to something again, uh, which I love to, to do. So if you do want that, just, again, draw me an email, bob at thedustofeed.com, and, um, and I'll get you on that. I don't care about your email. It's just that that's your login, and I have to set that up with them. Um, so let's remember now, next week, uh, we'll be doing part five on our uh, homework series. Right? We're doing Mackie and uh, his Matthew series. This is the Kingdom of Blessing. We'll go over what we traditionally call the Beatitudes which, again, draws some really wonderful things to, to to discuss. And I think things that will stretch us a little bit, things that you thought and you were comfortable with, I think you're going to find yourself being um, uncomfortable. So um, I think that's something you <laughs> we need to r remember with those. Um, and the links to that and all those are on the website as well. So uh, next week we have that. And then after that, I don't know, I'm moving. I'm the apartment that we're in. We're building a house and the apartment we're in, we have to leave the apartment. Long story. You want to know that sometime? Talk to me. I'll tell you that story. It's not worth the airtime. But um, suffice to say that it's going to mess stuff up in the studio and those kind of things. So I'm not sure what's going to happen after the, the next episode for, for a small span of time. So we'll talk about that. Maybe I'll know some more next week. We'll see. Uh, so that said, I will see you next week. And thanks for hanging out with us tonight. And I hope you were blessed on the Dusty Feet. <laughs>